I call my head north and my feet south and my tummy the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, I'm having trouble with the Middle East. It, it's spreading. So I'm trying to tell my wife, stop feeding me for the museum. <laughs> well, <laughs> hallelujah. All right, so uh, just want to, how many think uh, you're really spoiled here in City Life Church? Uh, about six hands, how many are spoiled? I, w I was just going through my notebook, uh, my life journal, uh, over the last year, uh, 2012 that was, wasn't it? And uh, I just appreciate the different ministries that we've got in the body of Christ here, like Mark Connor, my f uh, only begotten son, of course, Karen uh, last week, and Marcus uh, the week before, Andrew Orlandis, I think it is, Godwin Shim, how many I love Godwin, and uh, Josiah Connor, Paul Molyneux, Nicole Connor, Dan Leanne, um, Helen Meyer, I write in tongues, I can't always understand it, uh, Lynn Morassi, and Germa, and we mustn't forget Delgit, of course. Uh, God has put different ministries in the body of Christ. And uh, no one ministry can meet everybody's need. That's why God's put a variety of ministers in, 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 in uh, ministries in the church. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> Everybody said amen. amen. All right, now, I want, to, uh, I want you to turn, well, whatever translation. Maybe, maybe it's going to be up here. So what I want to talk to, uh, to you about is disciplines of my life. Uh, uh, people often ask me, uh, Kevin, what, what are the things that have helped you over the years? So uh, uh, I want to work through about seven. Each of them are, uh, are a time in themselves, like a message in themselves. But uh, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, whatever translation you have, I'm going to uh, amplify it here today. And uh, I want to emphasize certain uh, words before I get into my message. All right, so uh, Amplified verse uh, 24 through to uh, 27. So it says, Do you not know that in a race all the uh, runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So uh, run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it yours. Now every athlete who goes into training, conducts himself temperately and restricts, restricts himself in all things. They do it to win a wreath that will soon wither, but we do it to receive a crown of eternal blessedness that cannot wither. Therefore, I do not run uncertainly, uncer yeah, uncertainly without definite aim. I do not box as one beating the air and striking without an adversary. But like a box, I... Buffet my body. Now, that's not, you know, going to the cafe after every meeting. Uh, but I buffet, you know. Handle, uh, he puts it this way. Handle it roughly. Discipline. Everybody say discipline. discipline. Discipline it by hardships and subdue it for fear that after proclaiming to others the gospel and things pertaining to it, I myself should become unfit, not stand the test and be unapproved, and uh, rejected as a counterfeit. Uh, one translation says, lest I become a crackpot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to become a crackpot. So what I want to share with you today is uh, seven disciplines uh, that I've put on my life over the years that have really helped me and are uh, still helping me at my old age. Okay, um, a number of years ago, uh, we had some interns here. Uh, in Sydney, in Waverley Christian Fellowship it was then, and uh, they took me up for coffee. I still am hurting about that. I'm not sure whether I paid the coffee or not, because a lot of people take me up for coffee and I end up paying for it. But <laughs> apart from that, uh, forgiveness, you know, for, I forgive them. <laughs> Their favourite song is Silver and Gold Have I None. Anyway, uh, so some of the interns took me out and uh, they said to me, Brother Connor, could you summarize your life in one word? And I said, yeah, one word, discipline. And then I proceeded to give what I want to share with you today is seven disciplines that I've, I've put on my life. And uh, yeah, that, that was it. And uh, I, I hope you're not here, uh, those interns. 
because uh, after I spent my time uh, with the coffee and uh, seven disciplines, I said to them, well, uh, what time do you get, uh, get to bed at, uh, at night? Oh, they said about one or two o'clock, it depends. And I said, what about the next day? What time do you get up? Well, they said it depends on uh, if we have a lecture because they were in uni. uni and uh, oh, they said sometimes 12, 12.30, one o'clock. I said, that's your problem. Right there, lack of discipline. <laughs> so uh, I want to share with you uh, seven disciplines that I've put on my life. Now, if you're taking notes, or you've just got a good memory, okay, um, these are what I call self-imposed disciplines. Nobody can put them on you. Nobody can force them on you. Mark can't do it. I can't do it. You have to do it yourself. So these are self-imposed disciplines. And as I said, if you do not impose them on yourself, no one else can do it. Um, I remember when I was in Portland, Oregon, uh, sometimes uh, some of the kids would come into college, uh, Portland Bible College, and uh, we tried to get some disciplines on them. They were an undisciplined generation, and um, we couldn't do it. So do you know what we prayed? We prayed that they would get called up in the military. And when they were called up in the military, they had haircuts, they shaved their beards off and whiskers hanging out here. That's just unbelievable. I said, praise God. What the, what the church couldn't do, military could do. <laughs> so I won't pray that for any of you this morning. Okay, so uh, you notice in uh, what Paul says, he sort of talks about uh, two areas there, about boxing and about uh, a runner in a race, but just discipline. They were disciplined people, and we see that in the Olympic Games today. All right, so I want to give you seven disciplines, and uh, each of them, as I said, are um, a message in themselves. But let me give you a few thoughts on, uh, on each of them. Okay, so number one, and I think it should come up here, seven disciplines of my life. All right, number one, discipline of my mind. Now, as I said, each of these are sort of a complete message in themselves, but I want to give you a couple of thoughts. Uh, discipline of my mind. Uh, we are living in a, a very undisciplined generation, and, uh, you know, our mind is like a computer, garbage in, garbage out. You, you only get out of the computer what you feed into it, and uh, many of us do that. And uh, so uh, a couple of scriptures I want to give, uh, you know, give to your attention here, here that uh, one of the major things that helped me over the years is discipline of my mind. Now, when we go back to the Garden of Eden, we all have two gates and uh, the scriptures up there, Second Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 2 and 3, Paul tells us, he said, dividing the Corinthian church, he said, I fear that as, e uh, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be, dis uh, um, what's he say, so your minds should be deceived and beguiled by the serpent. Now the thing is, all of us, you know, we have our mind and that, but what do we feed into it? So one of the big disciplines I've put on my life is discipline of my mind. Now, as you go back to the Garden of Eden, you find that there's two gates uh, to the mind, and may I say this, if we don't guard the gates, then sin entered through the mind. And the first word of the gospel is repentance, discipline of the mind, a change of mind towards God and towards sin, toward eternal issues and so forth. So discipline of the mind. So when you go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, what happens? God gives uh, them a beautiful garden and places them in the garden. Said you can eat of all the trees of the garden. The only tree you're not to eat of is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Mrs. Adam is up the wrong end of the garden like a curious woman. Like my wife, she says, uh, I said, what are you doing, darling? She said, just looking. I said, just looking. I said, yeah, that's what Eve did. <laughs> and, uh, and the rest is history. But you see, the two gates to the mind, and see, I'm talking about things that I've imposed on myself, is the eye gate and the ear gate. So this snake in the grass came along, 
to the woman and said, you know, as God said, so he puts a doubt into the mind of the woman over the word, so she's not guarding the gates, the ear. So I guard the gates what I listen to, garbage in, garbage out. And then the other uh, gate is the eye gate. So we're told that when the woman saw the tree was good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she partook. So we have plenty of scriptures on that. So discipline of my mind. So you look at the scriptures and as you go through uh, Matthew chapter 16, you'll find that there's uh, three sources of thought that we all have. You have it, I have it, we all do. That's human nature. Thoughts that come from uh, God, thoughts that come from self, and thoughts that come from the devil. And uh, Matthew 16 is always a great illustration uh, to me on that, is that, um, that uh, Jesus said to the disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said, well, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and so forth. Now, there's nothing wrong with those thoughts. They're just human thoughts. Jesus didn't wear a dark collar, or Jesus saves badge on his lapel, or, you know, Jesus is Lord T-shirt. None of that. He just looked to be an ordinary man. But Jesus turned and made the per uh, question personal. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto to you but my father which is in heaven so one peter one moment peter gets a thought from what people are saying and then he gets another thought from god and then jesus immediately after that he starts to talk about going to the cross and uh, redemption and how the church would be born uh, upon this rock i'll build my church and so forth but he tells that peter that and as soon as he says i'm going to go to the cross you know G uh, peter took jesus and began to rebuke him. It's like, you know, Jesus, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You're not going to any cross. If you go to the cross, where am I going to fit in with the keys of the kingdom? There's none of that. And Jesus turned to, turned to Peter. He didn't say bring a bucket and vomit out the demon. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So the same mind that receives thoughts from God, thoughts from self, or thoughts from the devil... We all have to learn to discern the source of our thoughts. How many can say amen on that? So discipline of the mind. So I want to challenge you on that one. And lots of scriptures there. Uh, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, think on whatsoever things are pure, lovely, honest, good report. Uh, there's so many scriptures there. Where you can spend the whole thing. But discipline of your mind. I want to challenge you on that. Okay, number two. Very quickly, as I said, each of these are a message in themselves, and I did share them with uh, uh, the life group leaders many years ago, and also with uh, Godwin Group on Elevate and so forth. All right, number two, discipline of my attitudes. Discipline of my attitudes. If you bear with me, I want to uh, read, and I think this is uh, probably the best illustration that I, I've got uh, some of you may have read this, and it's by John Maxwell. And uh, let me just read, uh, bear with me a little bit. Discipline of my attitude, and I'll give you the punchline in a moment. Um, and he uses uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, Have this attitude or this mind or this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so the story goes, it was a beautiful day in San Diego, and my friend Paul wanted to take me for a ride in his airplane. Being new to Southern California, I decided to see our home territory from a different perspective. We sat in the cockpit as Paul uh, completed his instrument checks. Everything was a okay So Paul revved the engines and we headed down the runaway. As the plane lifted off, I noticed that the nose was higher than the rest of the airplane. I also noticed that while the countryside was truly magnificent, Paul continually watched the pardon me, the instrument, uh, instrument, uh, instrument panel. Since I'm not a pilot, I decided to turn the pleasure ride into a learning experience. All those gadgets I began, what do they tell you? I notice you keep looking at that one instrument more than the others. What is it? And I'd never, I, I'd never known this. I've done a lot of flying, uh, and I've heard about altitude. But, he, but the pilot said, that's the attitude indicator. 
Has anybody ever heard of a plane having an attitude indicator? I, I, I never have, so I learned that. How can a plane have an attitude? He, he asks. In flying, the attitude of the airplane is what we call the position of the aircraft in relation to the horizon. By now, my curiosity had been aroused, so I asked him to explain more. When the airplane is climbing, he said it has a nose-high <laughs> attitude because the nose of the airplane is pointed above the horizon. So I jumped in. When the aircraft is diving, you would call that a nose-down attitude. How many, you know, ever have come into a meeting with a nose-down attitude or a nose-up attitude? Anyway, watch it. So I jumped in, where the air, air, aircraft is uh, diving, you would call that a nose-down attitude. That's right, my instructor uh, continued. Now, here's the punchline on this. Pilots are con concerned about attitude because the airplane uh, of the, uh, the, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Pilots are concerned about attitude of the airplane because attitude indicates its performance. That was the punchline. Attitude indicates performance. So I've had to watch my attitude over the years, and I still have to. It's a discipline. I remember when I was in Portland uh, uh, Bible College in, in Portland City Temple, uh, I was also elder over music at the time, and uh, I remember a kid was on the drum. No reflection, any drummers here, but this kid was on the drums, and uh, he would just beat the, I was going to say beat the hell, but he, he just beat the something out of the pigskin on the drums. And I said to him one day, I said, okay, you're off drums for three months. He said, why? I said, you've got a rotten attitude. No, I haven't. <laughs> See? So what is our attitude? It comes out in what we minister and everything like that. So attitude indicates performance. Uh, let me just read a little bit more here. Now I can understand why the attitude indicator is in such a prominent place on the panel, I replied. Paul, sensing I was an eager student, continued, since the performance of the airplane depends on its attitude, it is necessary to change the attitude in order to change the performance. That was it. So we really have to watch our attitude. So attitude determines performance. It's a mindset, as somebody says. And uh, probably, you know, we all have favorite character studies. One of my favorite ones is Joseph. And, uh, you know, I've got 150 comparison points between Joseph and Jesus. And, uh, I mean, Joseph is the most beautiful type of Christ uh, in his attitude. Attitude to his father. Why did you send me out to my brother's attitude towards God? Why did you give me these terrible dreams about sheaves and everything? Attitude to his brethren when they went down to Egypt and then they sold him out. Just attitudes, attitudes, attitudes. We're all tested on our attitudes. We really have to watch that. Everybody said amen. amen. All right, number three, discipline of my prayer life. And I'd like to say a hearty amen uh, to what Mark has said. So, discipline my prayer life. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, we will give ourselves to prayer and the word. And then Matthew 21 verse 13 says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I love music, but not a house of music, but a house of prayer. So, prominence in our prayer. And uh, what I did for my own study was uh, I went through uh, the Gospel of Luke particularly, and looked at every reference to the prayer life of Jesus. And uh, I came up with this. If Jesus needed to pray, much more do we. If Jesus in his humanity totally depended upon the Father for all he was, all he said, all he did, and he continually kept that, you know, that line to the Father day and night, how much more do we? So, challenge to you, as we've already been challenged, what's your prayer life like? And uh, one of the things that's helped me over the years, so discipline of my mind, discipline of my attitude, discipline of my prayer, is, uh, 
is that every morning in the tabernacle of Moses, at morning and evening, they always had to burn incense on the altar incense. So I, uh, you, you have to work out. My wife's different to me. I generally get up about 6.30, uh, 7 o'clock if I'm tired. Uh, I was born tired. But uh, just to pray and just to f- make sure I feel right with God. So I went through the Gospel of Luke on the prayer life of Jesus, and I'm amazed at Nellie. The whole book is the prayer life of Jesus. And then I went through the book of Acts that was written also uh, by, by Luke, and I found that Nellie, 17 chapters at least, a prayer. So there's no use saying, oh, I never find time. You have to make time. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. And as I said, these are self-imposed disciplines. Nobody can put them on you. Nobody can force you to do it. You have to do it. That's my challenge to you today. So discipline of daily prayer. All right, number four, which is a discipline, and I'm reaping the benefit of that. Discipline number four is the discipline of the Word. Again, Acts chapter... Oh, well, no, Acts chapter 6, 4, uh, verse 4 is again the same as again. Discipline of the Word. Man shall not live by uh, bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Ephesians 5, 26, um, he's going to cleanse the church by washing of water by the Word. Now, I do hope, how many remember our acronym here? Uh, SOAP. What's S stand for? Scripture, read the Scripture. See, some people have said to me, uh, Kevin, I don't read the Bible because I don't understand it. And you know, eventually I came up with this thing. If you wait till you understand the Scripture before you read it, you'll never read it. And if you're taking down notes, reading precedes understanding. I was in the Air Force 100 years ago, it feels like, and... uh, I was confined to barracks for three days. I read the Bible. I was 18 years of age. I read the Bible through in three days. I didn't understand hardly a thing I was reading, but I read it. And God has put different ministries in the church to help you understand the Word. So read the Word. Get the Word in you. So S stands for Scripture, and O stands for observation. What does the Bible say? And then A stands for application, how can I apply it practically to my life, and then P stands for prayer. Pray the Word, read the Word, you know, as you, as you read the Word. I, I've done this over the years, even though I didn't understand years ago, but uh, you, you, if you don't, you don't make time, you'll never find time. You have to make time to read the Word. It's a discipline, same as your prayer life. So reading the Word. So I'd like to encourage you, what you've already been encouraged, Read the Word. Get the Word into you. Okay, uh, discipline number five. Discipline number five uh, is um, discipline of the... Let me find where I'm at. As I said, each of these are a message in themselves. Discipline of my spirit. Discipline of my spirit. Now, just a few, a few thoughts here. I have to continually and I've had to over the years, guard my spirit. So guarding my spirit. Uh, when, when God created man, uh, as I understand the Bible, that uh, God said, Let's, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And because God is triune being, he made me a triune being. E- every one of us are a triune being. And Paul, uh, when he writes on this, uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he says... Um, May the God of peace sanctify you wholly in spirit, your soul, and your body. So, because God is triune, one God, one Kevin Connor, praise God, uh, but he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there's only one Kevin Connor, everyone said praise God for that, and I am a spirit, soul, and body. Now, as you, as you get older, and this, I'm getting, I'm an old man now, but as you get older, you sort of seem to move from different temptations. When I was younger, uh, I had temptations of the body, of the flesh. So we have body cults, 
who are into all kinds of sins, drugs, immorality, alcoholism, and so forth. So, okay. And then the subtle thing is, and when I was in America, I found this out, is that there are soul cults. Develop the soul and sins of the soul. But the worst thing as you get older is to guard sins of the spirit. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here. I'll quote them just only because of time. Um, let me see where I had that. Uh, discipline of my spirit, yeah. Um, why don't you turn to 2 Corinthians. Let me uh, just read the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, or 6 and 7. Okay, uh, let me read from uh, the last verse uh, of chapter 6, and then I'll flow into uh, chapter 7. So he says, uh, Come out from among uh, unbelievers and separate yourselves or sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Then I will receive you and uh, kindly entreat you with favor, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, listen to chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since these great promises are ours, I'll be father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, great promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit. Uh, the the old, uh, old author I says, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit and bring our cons uh, consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of God. And as I've studied the word over the years, you know, the, the prodigal son, we talk about the, uh, the two sons of the father in the parable of Jesus. The prodigal son, he was guilty of sins of the flesh. He went into a far country, riotous living, wine, women and song, all of that. But the elder brother who was a nice, nice believer here in the house, sin, guilty of sins of the Spirit. And I remember one time confessing my faults here, uh, my faults here, uh, not my faults, my faults. Um, when I was pastoring a smaller church in Bendigo a number of years ago, uh, I found out something about a member. And uh, so what I did, I used the pulpit to blast that person without mentioning their name. And I felt pretty good about it. I thought I got the point across, uh, captive audience, uh, everything like that. And then I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Kevin, that was sinful preaching. Using the pulpit to blast somebody without naming them, sinful preaching. Sin of the Spirit. So if you were, if you sued it at all, uh, go through the book of uh, Proverbs particularly. It lists so many of sins of the Spirit. The proud in spirit, a haughty spirit, sins of the Spirit. And so I really had to guard my spirit, discipline of my spirit, that I keep my attitudes right, my spirit right, and uh, that I minister out of a pure word. Because I remember one brother saying to me in, in New Zealand a number of years ago, um, beyond your words, you impart what's in your spirit. And we may not always say it right or just say it exactly right, which I don't feel I'm doing today, but you impart what's in your spirit. And people pick up on your spirit. So I ask the Lord always, say, Lord, as I come to the service today and as I minister the word, help me to minister out of a pure spirit. How many are hearing what I'm saying? So keeping your spirit pure, because we impart beyond our words, we impart what's in our spirit. All right, number six. Uh, this may sound a little bit peculiar, but uh, discipline of honesty. Now, as I went through the Bible, and these are things, as I said, I've imposed on myself over my many, many years now. Discipline of honesty, and the opposite to honesty is hypocrisy. And uh, I, ju I just looked up some uh, translations, different translations, because everybody varies the word. But the uh, uh, Revised Standard Version says, an honest and good heart. 
Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower and the seed that was planted on good ground and brought forth good fruit. Uh, Philip's translation says a good and honest heart. The Living Bible says the same, honest and good-hearted. Uh, New English Bible says a good and honest heart. So, what, you know, as I said, honesty, discipline of honesty is not the opposite to hypocrisy. Old King James says that. Now, what I found out as I had a study one time there, uh, the Greek word for hypocrite is hypocritos. And uh, there were three characteristics of a hypocrite. He wore someone else's mask, and the idea in those days was they would be in an amphitheater, and uh, so the, the guy who was playing the part, he would run behind uh, the scene here, and then he'd come out wearing somebody else's mask. And then he would use somebody else's word, and then he would play somebody else's part. And as I went through Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 through to 28, uh, seven or eight woes Jesus gave. And the toughest word that Jesus ever had was, woe to you hypocrites, hypocrites, playing the, just uh, stage acting, wearing the mask, using someone else's word. And over the years, I've, I've, I've challenged myself, uh, discipline of honesty, and what you see is what you get. Am I one thing behind the pulpit or another thing at home? Ask my wife. She's not here today. Okay? Uh, that's it. Check it out. So we can all wear the, wear the mask and, and, and just play the hypocrite and not really be honest. And uh, I like uh, what uh, the old version says. Uh, the, the, the seed that fell on an honest and good heart brought forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. I remember uh, a situation in America, um, and I don't want to mention names here, just out of courtesy, is that uh, this prime minister, he got into immorality, or the president of USA, I won't mention who, uh, you will remember, <laughs> you'll know. And, uh, but he got away with it, and do you know why? Because he said, I'm doing a good job as a president. What I do is a, behind the scene. That's an invasion of my private privacy. Now, the sad thing is that got into a church that I was ministering at, ministered at there a few times, and uh, this elder, he fell into immorality, sorry to say, and so he was dismissed. But he sued the court, he sued the church, pardon me, and the minister for several million dollars and won the case. Do you know how he won the case? He said, I'm doing a good job as an elder, but what I do in my own privacy, that's an invasion of my privacy. And he won the case on that. So the, the thing is, am I honest? Or am I one thing here behind the pulpit? Am I another thing at home? Am I another thing behind people? So it's a discipline because all of us can wear the mask use Jesus' words, or use the Bible. We know it all backwards, but uh, am I real? That's the thing I say. Lord, help me to be honest. Everybody say amen on that and not play the hypocrite. All right, the, the last thing I want to spend a few moments on here is uh, number seven, and probably I used to do this first, but number seven, discipline of my time. I think Mark quoted it a few uh, weeks back. Psalm 90, which was written by Moses in verse 12, teaches to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, redeeming the time, buying up every opportunity, just buying up lost time, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So discipline of my time. I want to uh, share a little bit of my testimony here as I, uh, on this one. Discipline of my time. Il illustration I like to use, and I've had to use it just recently in a couple of funerals from the, some, a uh, couple of dear old saints from here, um, that we all enter life by this door called birth, 
and we go to the exit door, which is death. <clears throat> so between this door, birth, and this door, the exit door, death, we are all given a certain amount of time. None of us, and I'm the same, I'm being very honest with you, none of us know how long that space is or that time between the, the, the door of birth, entrance, and then the exit door. I don't know. I'll, I'll be 86 in a few weeks' time. I don't know what time God is going to give me. So I'm very conscious of this. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So redeeming the time. So over the years, I've tried to discipline my time as uh, just a disciplinarian. So, believe it or not, when I was younger and I used to go to, uh, to work down at uh, Abbotsford, I uh, used to ride 20 miles a day and I drew a chart out for myself. And now, this is me, but it worked. 168 hours per week. So my time for prayer, time for reading the Bible, my time to ride the bike to work. Uh, if, if I didn't ride the bike, I did on a train. I always take my Bible. Scare the living daylights out of people because they'd always say, oh, here's my seat. The moment they saw that black book, <laughs> they said, oh, here's my seat. You have my seat. Oh, I'm happy to stand. Oh, they'd move down. It's a wonderful way. <laughs> it worked for me anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. So... So when I was a kid of 14, let me tell you, and I've got to watch I don't cry here. When I was a kid of 14, being an orphan and never having a mum and dad, uh, which I tell a bit about in my story, this is my story. I remember when I escaped from the boy's home and I put my hand into the hand of the policeman and I said, I wish you were my daddy. I've never had a daddy. And then I used to always try and pal up with kids uh, who had parents visit them just to get a, a lolly or candy or something, see. And then uh, I was shipped out, being a ward of the state, uh, to a place called Cold Goa, way up in the Mallee. I got the huge sum of 10 shillings and sixpence a week. <laughs> and then I got a raise next year, 12 shillings and sixpence a week. Anybody remember a shilling? Anyway, so one of the days I came down to big, big city of Melbourne uh, for a holiday and uh, I went to the Salvation Army in Burke Street. Now, I was a kid of 14 and uh, those of you who have come from Salvation Army and know that, uh, know anything about it. In those days, they used to have what they call fishers of men. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So at the uh, close of the service, uh, this lady came up to me and 60 Burke Street, Melbourne, kid of 14, I was sitting at the very back seat, uh, ready to escape, you know, in case I got convicted or anything like that. And she said, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? I said, no. She said, would you like to? It's only come up the mercy seat or the penitent form. So the band was playing and it was, it's still so real to me, as I'll tell you why. The band was playing, only a step to Jesus. Why not take it now? Come on your sins confessing. You will receive the blessing. Do not reject the mercy that freely offered, is freely offered to you. And I remember that and I thought, I went out the front. I knelt at the Salvation Army penitent form as a kid of 14, frightened, timid, believe it or not, um, spacey, spacey kid, suicidal, wondering where my parents were, why I was dumped at three months of, of age, all that type of thing. But I went out the front and gave my heart to Jesus. No fanfare, just the peace of God. It was the beginning of knowing God as my father. Well, amazing thing, about 61 years later, the Salvation Army in Burke Street had closed down 
the, the services and they had gone mainly to social work, um, giving people jobs and all this type of thing. And uh, I was asked to do a seminar on end time events, which I did for Graham and Sue. And at the end of it, I, I was very, very moved because I said to the people, I said, we're going to finish the seminar. I just want to testify to you. And this, this is what happened. Years ago, when I came down to the big city of Melbourne, and then I joined the Vox Hill Salvation Army Band, uh, learned about four different instruments, don't know how to suck or blow now. <laughs> and uh, I remember just as a kid, sitting in the Salvation Army Hall, and some of the old Salvationists, and th this is the thing that hit me so much, some of the old Salvationists would say, when we were younger, we accepted the Lord as our Saviour. The Bible says, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Uh, by the way, just uh, put your hands up. How many became Christians uh, when you were in your teen years? Uh, hands up. It, it, it's just an historical fact, and it works in any congregation, that the same sun that melts the snow hardens the mud. So keep your heart like snow, because the older you get, the harder it is, and your heart becomes like mud, hard. And I remember some of these old Salvationists would say, I accepted the Lord when I was just a teenager. Remember you were created in the days of your youth. But then I backslid. I slipped away from the Lord. And then I came back to Jesus in my old age. But they, they, they would cry and cry, and this would stuck in my heart. Wasted years, wasted years, wasted years. We can never seem to get back. We just think of all the wasted years where we accepted the Lord, then backslid, slipped away from the Lord. Now we're old, and that stuck in me. And so back to Burke Street. As I finished the seminar, I said to the people, I told them my testimony, which I'm telling you now, that I was just about 14, sitting in the back seat of the Salvation Army there and coming out to the Pentateuch. Here was the thing. 61 years ago, and I was 75 years of age, I could look back. I was standing on the very spot where I gave my heart to Jesus, and I could look back, no wasted years. I want to challenge you on that. If you're away from God or you're backslidden, you'll kick yourself, as these people did. Wasted years, wasted years. And they say, don't waste your years. I can look back and I can tell you today, you know, it's, I'm 72 years now since I gave my heart to Christ. 72 and 14 is 86. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> and I want to testify to you. Don't waste your years. Redeem the time. Discipline your time. I still do it after these years. Read the word, have my prayer. My wife's the same. Uh, that's it. And these disciplines I've imposed on, my, on myself. So, I want to leave that with you this, uh, tonight, tonight. It was a very emotional time as I looked back that I hadn't got wasted years where I kicked myself. So, I want to challenge you. Why don't, why, why don't you just uh, close your eyes in prayer now? I've gone through seven disciplines that I said I impose on myself, and I'd like to encourage you. I hope, you, I hope you've been challenged by some of the things I've said. As I said, each of a message in itself. So, what about discipline of your mind? Garbage in, garbage out. Guarding the gates, the eye gate and the ear gate. Sin entered through the mind. If you're not doing that, I want to challenge you. What about discipline of your attitudes? What about discipline of prayer? What about discipline of the Word? What about discipline of your spirit? 
What about just being disciplined of honesty, not playing the hypocrite? And what about discipline of time? If you want to respond to any of that, any of those, maybe all of them, and you say, this is my New Year's resolution, I want to do that by the grace of God. Why don't you just raise your hand wherever you are, anybody at all. Yes, lots of hands. And I, I, I'd like to challenge you and leave that with you. Discipline, discipline. Why don't we all stand? And why don't we just join our hands across the auditorium or in the balcony uh, or either side, right side, left side. Uh, why don't we just join our hands together? Father, we just stand in your presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, for, Father, for the privilege of sharing together of uh, your inexhaustible, your wonderful word. And Father, I just humbly thank you from the bottom of my heart that as I look back over so many years, no wasted years, that you've kept me by your grace and you've helped me to impose these disciplines on myself. I can't impose them on anybody else, Lord. We have to do it. So I pray for everybody who raised their hand, Lord, brothers and sisters, younger people, older people, Lord, just help us to look back over our life and say, no wasted years, no lost time. Help us, Father. And we pray that you'll seal this word to all of our hearts. And we ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. God bless you and thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Really good, job. Thank you. Really good. Oh, I thought I was stumbling a lot. Fantastic. It would be good if we just uh, pray for Dad and for Reen uh, at this time, that uh, they would really know God's strength in their life. And uh, I can say firsthand that Dad lives everything that he's just said. And so really pray that uh, one or two of those principles will really impact your life for this year. And great for us as we leave just to have some conversations around our coffee and dinner and talk about what really impacted you. And what we can do in response. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for Dad today thank and for Reen who wasn't able to be here. Lord, thank you for the message tonight, but more than just the words. Lord, Dad's life. Lord, just a, a trophy of your grace. Lord, mm -hmm. in you saving him, him coming to know you as thank Father. You, Lord. And Lord, how he's been able to follow you all these years through your grace in thank his life you, and his response to that. And so we mm -hmm. pray for everyone in this room tonight. Lord God, wherever we are right now, we can't go back and start again. We can't have a, a new beginning, but we can make decisions today yes. that can make a brand new end mm. for us. And so I pray whoever we are today, young or old, wherever we are right now, we would make mm. choices, Lord, Thank to respond you, Lord. to your love mm. and to live lives that really matter, both for now and eternity. Bless yeah. Dad and Reen with strength Thank and health. You, Thank you for the message tonight in mm. Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Let Let's thank Dad again. Yeah. Yeah, let me say one thing. Okay. Uh, let, let me say one thing as I finish and get off the platform, is that uh, some people have come to me and, and they've said, Kevin, we've wasted so many of our years, what can we do? And this is what I felt, and I've said this to them, that God said in Joel, he said, I will restore to you the years that have been lost. And God can do that. He can make up so that you're busy, busy, busy and dizzy but he can make up for that time. God bless you and thank you.